denk dat je niet zo vreselijk veel macht hebt om dingen anders te laten gaan. Dat gebeurt gewoon niet. Maar ja, ik ben wel blij dat ik uh, gewoon nog leef natuurlijk. Ik wil het aimé. Compleetement euh, distordu. Et, il est là, il est plus là, mais en même temps il est là. Quand tu as les spalle un dolore, une souffrance de ce genre, tu apprécies aussi les petites choses. Euh, non è scontato niente, non è scontato che respiri, non è scontato che stai in piedi e cammini, puoi correre, euh, non è scontato vedere il sole, non è scontato niente. Bijna verdwaasd rond in een trance rond. Um, maar ik moet zeggen, de zorg eromheen is wel heel erg goed. En ja, het was een heftige tijd, maar wel een mooie tijd. Welke gevoelens ik heb ervaren. Ja, je bent ontzettend nauw betrokken bij, uh, bij mijn vrouw, wat die meemaakt. En je, je, kunt daar, je kunt daar niks mee, maar je moet er uh, zelf mee uit de voeten. En je hebt wel het volle vertrouwen, dat had ik wel steeds. Sono un medico di terapia intensiva, non un rianimatore, nel senso che lavoro con i neonati, quindi mi occupo di tutt'altra, di, di, di bambini molto molto piccoli, non, non, non faccio il loro stesso lavoro, però chiaramente il rapporto con i medici è stato condizionato anche dalla, dalla mia posizione, tra l'altro sono dei colleghi perché sono nel mio stesso. Quindi da una parte avevo, ero sicuramente facilitata nel comprendere eh, razionalmente quello che stava succedendo, cioè non avevo bisogno dei lunghissimi colloqui perché mi spiegassero ehm, per avere notizie cliniche, perché eh, era più semplice riassumermi le cose. D'altra parte, dal punto di vista umano, dal punto di vista, dal punto di vista, della, uh, dal punto di vista emotivo, questo non è servito a niente, anzi forse ha peggiorato le cose, perché uh, sapevo cosa poteva succedere e non volevo accettarlo. Ora, lo che mi motiva è eh, migliorare la vita della gente. Ya no es tanto la técnica, ¿no?, como cuando eres joven, porque llega un punto que la técnica es técnica y no tiene ningún secreto, sino las pequeñas cosas que pueden hacer que marcan la diferencia. El hablar con el paciente, con la familia, el hacer una educación sanitaria que nadie ha hecho hasta ese punto y tú no lo sabías porque dabas por hecho que lo habían hecho. Esas cosas son las que te motivan, el mejorar el cuidado del paciente. El... Il faut faire du cas par cas, en fait. C'est primordial. Parce que chaque histoire est différente. Et quand vous vous trouvez en tant que patient, en tant que famille de patients, dans cette situation, dans un univers où vous ne parlez pas cette langue-là, cette langue faite d'acronymes et de termes techniques que vous ne connaissez pas, quand vous vous retrouvez face au savoir et que du coup vous vous retrouvez impuissant, que vous vous retrouvez stupide, que vous vous retrouvez humilié, que vous vous retrouvez démuni, comment faire Jokainen lääkäri varmaan pelkää komplikaatiota jotakin, että mitään ei niin kuin ei hiffaa jotain juttua, mitä, mitä olisi pitänyt hiffata, joskin siinäkin auttaa se, että arvoin tekee yksin, yksin koko päivää töitä. Nämä tuli nyt äkkiseltään mulle mieleen. And what scares me is that making those decisions and making those wrong decisions and the realization that that decision uh, of that decision in three, four weeks time, where you end up having a patient who in effect can be crippled by life-sustaining therapy, um, which may not have been in their best interests or the family's best interests. And that still scares me. And I think it scares a lot of colleagues, but um, intensive care is much more multidisciplinary now. And I think that has helped our decision-making um, and has reduced that um, fear factor. Honesty and humility go a long way. 
And most patients and relatives understand that we're also human and mistakes can happen uh, and should be openly discussed. Οι ασθενείς όμως μένουν, έρχονται σε επαφή με μας ιδιαίτερα αυτοί που βγαίνουν από το νοσοκομείο, που βγαίνουν σε κέντρα αποκατάστασης και ύστερα από πάρα πολύ καιρό έρχονται να μας συναντήσουν γιατί ξέρουν τα πρόσωπά, τα πρόσωπά μας, τις φωνές μας, τον αγώνα που δίνουμε μέσα στο χώρο για να καταφέρουμε να τους σώσουμε, να επιβιώσουν και έρχονται να μας δουν, να μας γνωρίσουν από κοντά, να τους δούμε κι εμείς. In particular, the nursing colleagues, we arranged a wedding for a patient who was at the end of his life and had decided to marry his long-term partner before he later died. And it was very moving to be part of this very special event in the intensive care unit. It's a real privilege to be able to support a patient and their family through that um, what I hope is the worst thing that ever happens to them in their lives, to, to be able to support them through that, hopefully to recovery, or to support them um, through uh, managing a dignified death. Il faut, il faut, faut ramener la vie. Pourquoi est-ce que tout est si blanc et voire gris? Pourquoi est-ce que ce lino queen autant sous les crocs des médecins, c'est insoutenable? Pourquoi est-ce que, pourquoi est-ce que tout était autant aseptisé? C'est pas trois photos qui vont empêcher les gens de travailler. Moi, je pense que c'est important de ramener. Euh de ramener de la vie à cet endroit où, euh, où on se trouve euh, à la frontière d'eux, au bord d'eux, on se trouve euh, dans une espèce de no man's land où on euh, ne sait pas sur quoi ça va déboucher. Quoi. La mia opinione della vita intensiva è fantastica perché mi hanno salvato la vita e dopo tre anni sono qui. Anche a un altro ospedale che mi hanno dato per morto, per fortuna sono arrivato in questa terapia intensiva e mi hanno salvato veramente la vita. Solo belle cose possono uscire dalla mia bocca ovviamente, perché senza di loro non sarei, non sarei qui, ripeto, non sarei qui oggi. Intensive care medicine allows me to learn something new every day. So every day I meet colleagues and I hear of their new technologies, new advances and progress in their particular specialty. But most importantly, every day is a different day with new challenges and I enjoy the interaction with my colleagues and most importantly with patients and their relatives. So it is a, provides a great variety, it's different every day and it's a specialty where progress is made on a, on a regular basis. Grazie perché mi hanno ricordato anche come si lavora. Cioè, io faccio questo mestiere, lo faccio da tanti anni, ci sono dei momenti in cui sei stanco, in cui hai, hai, hai le tue cose, nel senso che hai la tua vita, hai delle preoccupazioni, però Io ero serena quando andavo via, non perché sapevo che non sarebbe morto, poteva morire, poteva star male, ma era nelle mani migliori, sapevo che era nelle, nelle migliori mani e, e questo mi dava, mi dava quel minimo di tranquillità che potevo cercare. È giusto che uh, i bambini che mi vengono affidati e i genitori quando vanno a casa possano pensare la stessa cosa. Siamo nelle migliori mani, quindi dobbiamo sempre fare il meglio. Grazie a loro per essere il meglio.
I'm an intensive care nurse and I'm proud to work with a multidisciplinary team um, to, to work together to fight COVID-19. Together we are intensive care medicine. I'm an anaesthetist and I'm proud to be an intensivist. We intensivists are working together to fight COVID-19. Together we are intensive care medicine. I'm a primary intensivist and I'm proud of it. We intensivists are working together side by side to fight COVID-19. Together we are intensive care medicine. I am an anesthesiologist and I'm proud to be an intensivist. We intensivists working together to fight the COVID-19. Together, we are intensive care medicine. I am a surgeon and I'm proud to be an intensivist as well. We intensivists are working together to fight COVID-19. Together, we are intensive care medicine. at the end of May. Again, a marathon of eight hours with experts from different parts of the world to share what we've learned from COVID, how we can rebuild the future, and how we can come out of this situation together. Hello everyone, welcome to this webinar organized by the Ethics Section of the European Society. My name is Diederik van Dijk, I'm the Deputy Chair of the Ethics Section of the ESICM and I will moderate this session. Today's topic is difficult decisions and this is not about the difficult decision between propofol or medezolam or the choice between a balanced crystalloid or a saline. What we would like to discuss today is um, difficult decisions about starting or withholding or withdrawing ICU life support. And these decisions are often straightforward. Um, in most situations, it is obvious that a patient will benefit or will not at all benefit from an ICU treatment. However, we are also familiar with those cases where the decision to start or withhold or withdraw ICU treatment can be very difficult. The prognosis is probably not good, but we are not certain. There are different opinions without, within your ICU team or the family member. Family members may have a different view than the medical group. And sometimes you simply do not have the resources. Even when a patient has a small chance of a favorable outcome, you may need the ICU bed for another patient who has a better chance of a good outcome. Now we know that the decisions about starting or foregoing ICU treatment vary across the world. In some countries, it is highly unusual to institute a treatment limitation, whereas in other countries, this is quite normal to do. And research has shown that even within countries, there can be a lot of variation uh, in the chance of getting a limitation in life support. Uh, and even within a single hospital, there might be a lot of variation that when intensivist A is on call, uh, treatment may be stopped, whereas when intensivist B is on call, the treatment may be continued. Now, when these decisions about ICU treatment are difficult or when there is a lot of variation in these decisions and the outcome of these decisions, it is helpful to have a protocol or a, a format to, for taking these decisions in the best possible way. Now, what are components of a good decision? Who should be involved? Who speaks for a patient who is incapacitated? The first speaker of this webinar will therefore discuss this decision-making process thoroughly. Because of the COVID pandemic, 
we are more aware than ever of the possibility that we simply do not have enough ICU beds. We have seen this in northern Italy a year ago, we have seen it in Brazil and in, in India. And well, resources are limited and ICU care has to be rationed then and we do triage. But also under normal circumstances, without a pandemic, limited resources play a role in our decisions to give or to withhold ICU treatment. Sometimes we refuse a candidate for ICU treatment simply because we consider the chance of recovery too small. But we may say to the patient and the family, ICU treatment is futile. What we mean is that we don't have the resources to take the small chance. And in reality, we are not always so certain about that futile or the chance of zero that the patient will recover. And in this way, we often confuse futility with rationing. And this can be very stressful and confusing for patients and members of the team. And therefore, the second speaker of today's webinar will discuss the topic of implicit rationing. Now, before I introduce the first speaker, um, I would like to let you know that if you have questions, you can send them to us using uh, the website and we will treat the questions after the two presentations. Now, it's a great pleasure to introduce the first speaker, that is Monika Kerkhoffs. She is an intensivist at the University Medical Center in Utrecht in the Netherlands. She has a special interest in decision-making and long-term outcome of ICU survivors. She conducted a PhD on decision-making in the ICU, focusing on prognostic information and patients' preferences. She is a member of the, of the section on ethics for several years, and she's motivated to increase call concordant care in all ICU patients. Monica. Thank you, uh, Diederik. Um, thank you for your introduction. And it is indeed true that I will talk about who speaks for the patient. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to present to you a case which has a patient which has been in our ICU for a while. Um, then talking about interprofessional versus patient surrogate shared decision making. Talking a bit about the complexity of decision making in the ICU and then the role of surrogate decision makers and the pitfalls when asking them to make decisions. So let me start with introducing to you our patients. So this is Mr. Jones. He's a 62-year-old male patient, as you can see, and he's known with heart failure. Uh, due to this, he has a mild kidney insufficiency and approximately one yearly admission at the cardiology. So of course, it's Saturday evening when he presents himself to your emergency room with signs of an acute myocardial infarction. So you are called to see him and you find him evidently in cardiogenic shock. So he gets sedated, intubated and transported to the cat lab. Uh, there's a um, coronary angiography performed where they see his known coronary artery disease without any options to perform a PCI. So they, they give him, 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 they start inotropes and then he is brought to you to your ICU. And it might not be a surprise, but two weeks later, he is still there. So the patient is now in your ICU for two weeks. He's still sedated. He's on mechanical ventilation. He's on continuous renal replacement therapy and still has the balloon pump in place. And together with inotrope, his circulation is supported. He has uh, had a complication. He had a thrombotic event of his left limb and he has ischemia of his left lower leg. So we now face some difficult decisions. Should we proceed to permanent renal replacement therapy since we all have decided and concluded that his renal function will not recover? What about amputation of his left lower leg? And 
the cardiologist feel that his cardiac function will not improve and he might need mechanical cardiac support. These are difficult decisions. And one of my colleagues said when we had these decisions, well, should we actually continue unlimited ICU treatment? Are all these decisions appropriate? All four decisions are examples of difficult decisions in the ICU. And difficult decisions or complex decisions can be defined as decisions that you would not usually take by yourself, decisions that need consent, or decisions that have impact on patients' life after ICU. So how should you take these decisions? First of all, you need to make sure that in your ICU you have a process, a protocol, a checklist, an instrument, a framework, something that describes your decision-making strategy. And this process or protocol should at least describe when you feel difficult decisions arise and when you use this protocol, how you make the decisions, what kind of aspects and items do you include in decision-making and who is involved in your decision-making process. So let's zoom in on these three items first. So when using this difficult decision protocol, there are two ways you can look at it. First, when important or complex decisions arise, for example, deciding on renal replacement therapy or mechanical cardiac support. These are decisions that impact your patient's life. You could also use time. In our ICU, we use this protocol in difficult decisions, but we also use the protocol when a patient is in our ICU for over one week. So for every, every week the patient is in our ICU, we sit together and use the protocol to decide is it still appropriate to continue unlimited ICU treatment. So if you know when you use it, you should describe in your protocol or within your team how you take these decisions. So there are three items that should be in that at least. First of all, prognosis. So you need to make sure what to know the prognosis of your patient. You have to ass assess the situation, the diagnosis, the increase or decrease in health status for the last period in your ICU, but also the age of the patient, his or her frailty, the comorbidities. That all together makes your estimate of the prognosis of the patient. Second, you need to know the preferences of the patient. You need to know the values and goals of the patient you have at your ICU. Because you need to know what kind of goals do we set and when is our care goal concordant. Thirdly, you have to assess proportionality. Does the outcome outweigh the burden of the ICU admission or the burden of long-term impairments? So these are the aspects you need to describe. And you can go into many more detail. You can also describe in your protocol if you need consensus for all your decisions. You can describe how uh, to report the discussion you had and how to communicate with families or primary care. Givers. Finally, you have to describe who is involved in your decision making, who speaks for your patient. Is it one of those ICU caregivers or is it the patient or the surrogate? So talking about the patient or the surrogate decision maker also brings in the advanced directive as important information. So some patients might have verbalized or written advanced directive directing you to goals and values of the patient. Make sure that if you have an unrepresented patient, you know your country-specific guidelines, how to handle decision-making in these specific patients. On the one hand, you have the patient, but on the other, you have the ICU caregivers. You have ICU nurses, physicians, the physiotherapist, surgeon, cardiologist, 
primary care physicians you have caregivers. So who speaks for the patient? Is it the ICU team or is it the patient or surrogate? So shared decision making is a process of three steps, gathering information, discussing information, and then taking the decision. So who should speak for the patient? These are two different strategies with distinct features. So first, interprofessional shared decision making. This is the strategy in which professionals look at the patient and assess options. For example, in oncology, uh, the oncologist, radiologist and pathologist, they sit together and think this patient is this patient suitable for chemotherapy or surgery. And this is what we do as well. Not every patient that can't be weaned of the ventilator will be offered a lung transplant. And not all patients will be offered mechanical cardiac support. So with your professional team, with the whole team of ICU caregivers and more, maybe even the primary care physician, you assess the feasibility of all options and you consider prognosis in this. And why is this such a valuable strategy? It is a very valuable because you have the most experienced members right there with you. And using them, you make sure you have optimal use of knowledge and expertise. It is also known that using your whole team enhances prognostication and it reduces bias. Escalation bias or sunk cost bias is reduced by using the whole team and not just one physician. So that one physician that might have um, decided to continue treatment a week before might be more um, likely to do so because of this escalation bias. Using interprofessional shared decision making also reduces moral distress. Moral distress for the physician, since he or she does not have to make decisions all by him or herself, but also for nurses. If they know they can speak up and their opinion is valued, that reduces distress. And finally, it improves your ethical climate. When you as a team are able to discuss these kind of decisions together, your ethical climate will be improved. So what about a patient? We need shared decision making with the patient as well, because the patient or surrogate is the only one who can really tell us if this outcome we see for the future is acceptable. It is the only one who could express preferences and who could decide whether the costs in terms of suffering outweigh the benefits. So now we have these two decision-making strategies. We have the interprofessional part and the part with patients and surrogates. And it has been stated that you need to get a professional opinion on treatment first before you go into the shared decision-making process with the patient. But if you do not know your patient, and you do not know the values and preferences, you cannot come with a treatment suggestion. So these two, these two proce processes are actually intertwined. They, they need to go together. So you can look at this as a continuum. On the one hand, it is the professional who has the biggest say in the decision that has to be made. Well, on the other hand, you have the patient who decides what should be done. And you could look at this like a skill or a ruler when situations ask for different strategies or patients or circuits ask for a different strategy. For example, it is known that in more value-laden decisions, patients or surrogates want to have a bigger say. But it is also known that with increasing stay in the ICU, surrogates are more likely to leave decisions with the professional, probably because of increasing trust and familiarization with the ICU and the caregivers, 
makes that surrogates lead the decisions with the professionals. But also not all surrogate or all patients are the same. Some want control over decisions, while others find the burden of decision making too heavy and tend to leave decision making with the professionals. So when you have these difficult decisions that you have to make, you have to assess the situation and your preferences of the patient or surrogate you're dealing with to see on which part of the scale you are making your decisions. So now we know this process, we know when and how and with who we make these decisions. It looks quite simple, but still it is very complex. And this complexity is in the patient and it's in the surrogate. So you all know that patients are often not able to participate in decision making. They might be sedated or they're suffering from a delirium or are in pain or shortness of breath. And even when you are able to communicate with your patient, it is very hard for them to oversee the consequences of the decisions that have to be made. For example, our patient needs to decide whether he wants to live with a mechanical cardiac support. So how can this patient oversee how he will appraise that life if those impairments will be acceptable? So these co complications often bring us to talking to surrogate decision makers. And these surrogates have two very important roles. First, they have to provide us with the bigger picture. So we often see the Polaroid picture. We see the patient in our ICU, we see him for a couple of days, we see recovery or not, but we cannot see the patient in his system. We don't know the, the social system he or she lives in, work he does, family members, religion. We need to know the patient a bit more. That's one role of surrogates, provide us with this information. Second, they have to provide us with long-term uh, appraisals. So they have to help us what kind of quality will be acceptable for this patient, which burden will be acceptable, which aspects make that the patient will have um, a satisfaction with outcome, which impairments are acceptable, and what level of participation is needed for this patient to be happy with outcome. These are the rules they have, and there are three important pitfalls. They are often insecure and will not provide you with information. And sometimes they do, but they are wrong. And that can be because they're biased. There can be a projection bias where the caregiver or surrogate um, projects the outcome he or she values for the patient as being the opinion of the patient. And that means that you have to think a bit further about appraisal. So we know from many outcome studies the health-related quality of life. We know impairments patients will suffer. But we actually cannot know for the individual patient how he or she will appraise his or her life. So we have done a study in our center and it has been done in other centers as well. And it shows that even though patients have severe impairments, they will rate their outcome as acceptable in the majority of patients. And Detsky showed in a couple of studies that even some patients say my quality of life has improved one year after ICU. And these were patients that had impairments afterwards that they didn't have before. So it's very important to know more of your patient because this kind of acceptance is mostly related to the system the patient lives in. So pitfalls is that they are wrong, they're in one third not congruent with what the patient says, and that is because of appraisal and that is because values are variable. So it is known that patients tend to want less intensive treatment when outcomes become more pessimistic. Also changes in marital status or mobility changes patients' preferences. So advanced directives are important, but they are not the holy grail always.
So what we need to do together with the surrogates is assess the system in which the patient lives and interpret information. Not take the information and make a decision, but interpret the information that has been given to you and partner with them in making these decisions. So if we have this decision-making protocol in our ICU, are we perfect? Rather, we are not. Um, in this patient, we proceeded to amputate his leg. He got mechanical cardiac support and we proceeded to dialysis. And this patient recovered in our ICU, was very weak. And while recovering, he stated that he did not want this life. And he requested us to forego ICU treatment. And after three months of ICU care, he died in our ICU. So take home messages. Complex decision-making needs a process and make sure you have the protocol in your ICU. You need interprofessional shared decision-making, but you also need the patient and the surrogates in your decision-making. These two processes, these two strategies are intertwined. You have to make sure that you partner with surrogates, not make, let them make the decisions, but partner with them to understand the patient and to assess outcome estimates together. So thank you very much. You can ask your questions, of course, through the website. You can also email me, find me on Twitter. And on this last slide, I have some references. Not every reference I used is on this slide, but these are some, some key studies that might be interesting for you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Monica, for your excellent talk. Um, as I mentioned, we will do questions after the second presentation. So I will now continue and introduce Jos Latour, who will do the second talk. Uh, Jos is a professor in clinical nursing at the University of Plymouth, and he has been an intensive care nurse for over 30 years with a special focus on families and children. His clinical post is based at the Derryford University Hospital in Plymouth and Musgrove Park Hospital in Taunton in the UK, where he is the director of the clinical schools aiming to drive research forward with clinical staff. And the research programs of yours are related to patient and family-centered care, end-of-life care practices and emergency care. Jos is a member of the ESICM for nearly 30 years and he received a Lifetime Achievement Award of the ESPNIC. Jos, the floor is yours. I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Uh, sorry. Um, technical issue with my microphone. All done. Um, second half of the, well, once again, thank you very much, uh, Dietrich, for the kind introduction. Uh, second half of this webinar, we're going to talk about implicit rationing. Um, so the rationing is something you might not have heard of. It's not used that much in the intensive care because we often talk about limitations. But um, hey, -ho, I think um, we need to have a debate around it. Um, what we are doing is I'm going to set the scene, try to look at definitions of rationing. Um, we look at the continuing case of uh, has been discussed by Monica. I'll come back in to share decision making model um, and look at how we can improve this uh, in our ICU as a multi-professional model. And we look back at the finally at the the complexity of implicit rationing of nursing care. Uh, so, I'm not talking about the treatment so far. So, let us set the scene and have a look at, at what is explicit or implicit rationing. So, the explicit rationing in this paper has been defined as decisions made by an administrative body to specific allocation of treatments or ser services. So these resource allocations is another example of explicit rationing. And then the definition of implicit rationing, um, that are decisions 
that are not necessarily made on the basis of a formalized structure, but rather on an ad hoc uh, nature in the ICU. In our case, what we do nearly on a daily basis. Now it gets a little bit tough um, when we talk about explicit rationing and implicit rationing in intensive care. Um, particularly the COVID almost nearly pushed us to the limits where you might say explicit rationing is that the limits of not enough ICU beds, um, even if we would, would add ICU beds and then the resources such as staffing levels is not enough, is there the limitation coming in and what kind of uh, explicit rationing does influence these difficult decision makings? And it's often related to on governmental uh, organizational levels. But implicit rationing, if we look at what we are experiencing now during the COVID-19 pandemic, is that hey, how we might have limitations that have um, led to limiting care that would normally never ever have been provided, that would have normally be provided. So we are we stretching ourselves to the edge when we have the COVID pandemic, when we have all the PPE carrying uh, the, 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 the stressful environments, the pressure we have, would we then limit certain issues in our care, uh, particularly for nursing. This is really an important issue which can increase stress levels as well. So it, it, it gets really tough actually. And I think this paper published in the ICM fairly early on the pandemic by Arivi. Um, it's, yeah, the, uh, the pandemic showed possibly uh, other transformative changes within the ICU, because we do see changes in flexible staffing, we do see changes in ICU bed capacity, but do these changes all and contribute to difficult decision making and where the explicit rationing of, of, of resources and care are actually contributing to our implicit rationing of not delivering the care we usually would do. As an example, um, family-centered care in the intensive care unit, um, we used to have open visiting hours. Well, here we go, COVID-19 taught us something different where family members were often uh, refused, not allowed, due to well, infection prevention and whatever reasons. Um, and this rationing, this rationing um, of, um, let's say, limitations of visiting, uh, visiting policies have been implemented and has created fairly stressful levels among staff, but also among family members. And I think um, if you look at those concepts of the explicit and implicit rationing, many intensivists were asked actually to make difficult decisions, as it has been uh, described by Rose Baum in the New England Journal of Medicine early pandemic, uh, describing the situation in Italy, where some centers applied lottery or first-come, first-served principles to prioritize patients. But the appropriateness of such approaches to life-threatening situations has been challenged by many of us, by, by colleagues, by the public, but also by politicians. Well, following up on that, and it's a nice good debate to have all these papers uh, having an international debate by Jean-Louis Vincent, actually, in the European Heart Journal of Acute Cardiovascular Care, he actually made two distinct differences in, within explicit and implicit rationing when it comes to difficult decision making. Because yes, we might need to be able to take into account the age limits, the comorbidities, the advanced or underlying illness, but we should never ever have taken into account the first come first serve concept or uh, the lottery issue, which which we actually faced in some countries and maybe even up to today in some countries in the world are facing. So let's go to, back to the case of Mr. Jones as described by Monica earlier. Um, Bill, you know, one yearly admission came in and in the hospital with Monica. Um, I'm talking about in detail and two weeks time, suddenly 
you have a few issues where Monica's team were looking at what kind of decisions are we making, particularly in, 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 in regard to renal replacement therapy, amputation, lower leg, mechanical cardiac support. This all I like to sort of bring back a little bit to what Monica has been addressing, and which is actually the shared decision making. And I would like to go from a theoretically point of view, try to look at that, because we need to look at that as a team work system. Um, so coming back to, to interprofessional shared decision making, which has been addressed by Monica, um, is um, our colleague, respected colleague, uh, the case of Hans has published in Critical Care Medicine, this model about interprofessional shared decision making, which you can see is a stepwise model where an individual decision making goes to an information exchange, goes to an a tool action, exist which then hopefully would come into a shared decision making uh, consensus um, discussion which should always be multi-level team decisional making and what we often lack actually is to review back this whole shared decision making in what was the outcome and we need to look more at the outcome it's not the mortality only but rather what is this family satisfaction in in terms of difficult decision making and we do have instruments available specifically looking for family satisfaction in the icu when it comes to difficult decision making um, the ethics uh, section of the european society in cancer care medicine has worked with a collaborative larger group of uh, colleagues looking at um, interprofessional shared decision making model and we've done a systematic review and come up with an expert uh, panel from a theoretically point of view i mean there are actually five recommendations coming in which you need to take into account as a team member within your unit which is and should be a collaborative process among clinicians so we have evidence enough over the last 20 years and survey studies have documented that nurses are not always involved or asked to be involved in difficult decision making processes and unfortunately up till today in some countries in some regions that still exist and i think um, i'm a very much an advocate for a collaborative process where we clinicians should work collaboratively together and have this this, this shared decision making process started as early as possible recommendation number two is engaging in in, in, in interprofessional shared decision making processes, we all need to be engaged and we need to have implementation strategies because obviously it's not that you implement more if you don't do it at all, but there are, there are instruments out there. The last two are actually implementing it should be having a structured approach and we need more evidence how that works and what kind of outcomes do we see. Because basically, if you look at interprofessional shared decision making, what do we have different views to really aim for a hundred percent consensus? Um, particularly when it comes to um, implicit rationing of and treatment, where we have these difficult decisions. You, ideally, you won't have um, consensus. However. In this study, with a large group of uh, uh, nurses and doctors, you can see already in differences in moral difference between the mechanical ventilation withdrawal and withdrawal of any other life-sustaining therapy, where nurses found it more difficult and diffuse had different views than the than the doctors. Um, right. So here is the try this one. Then um, I came across uh, something. The, the question of climate, if, if you would have definitely a drive to the, the interprofessional shared decision making, try this questionnaire. It helps you to support your performance in your healthcare team in your ICU. Just as a small gesture here. We talked about decision making and difficult decision making. Um, things has been your that. Uh, so, I've 
just want to share one slide with you, which is related to virtual decision making, because we, we don't always allow, since COVID, the full members of the family into the ICU, and the surrogate are being included into difficult decision makings. And, and this paper actually addresses quite well this, this, this virtual shared decision making. Um, I don't, I don't want to use it that too much, and I hope it's only for another half a year or so that we don't need to do virtual decision making. But, but we learned the, about the opportunity we can engage the um, family members from home, uh, and we can allow time and space at any time um, where we might need um, need some, some well, well, you might need to uh, discuss that with your family members as surrogates at what time point it's the best to come in and collect and have a more wider group in this shared decision making. So virtual shared decision making, there are opportunities there, but there are also challenges. So don't underestimate that sometimes you don't want to have a virtual shared decision making when it really comes to complex, difficult decisions, because you always need to follow up with your with your surrogates, with your family members, with your patients, even if the most difficult decision has been made, particularly in our COVID. So implicit rate of care, here we go again. Looking back to Mr. Jones, our case of Monica, so what is the optimal nurse care actually? And is implicit rationing um, uh, um, of nursing care allowed and at what stage? Just to show you how difficult the implicit rationing is for nursing care. So it has been debated nearly what, 13 years ago already by a group in, in Basel and in Switzerland, where they, they sort of worked towards the validation of Basel extent of rationing uh, of nursing care instrument. Well, there are various levels of implicit rationing of nursing care. These are the decision makings which are based on your clinical judgment. Now, this clinical judgment is based on the workload of the nurses, on the experiences of the nurses, the, 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 the advanced care planning of the nurses and the experiences what nurses do have, as well as taking into account on the upper level in the gray box, the patients and the family needs. Um, that needs to be taken in account. So basically the complexity here documented in this, this figure already shows that we are struggling sometimes in the clinical practice in the ICU, what, what kind of uh, explicit, of implicit rationing of nursing care is allowed. And it should be related to the outcome of our patient, but also ideally to the outcome of us nurses uh, or staff in the ICU. Um, so making implicit rating explicit, I think it's important that we have actually no authority or guidelines for that. Because um, based on what? Can we, if we look at the case of Mr. Jones, look at sedation management? Does that need to be changed if we come to a implicit rationing of treatment? Do we need to limit our pressure also prevention care with Mrs. Is mouth care out of range now because we have an implicit rationing of a treatment of Mr. Jones um, or passive limb exercise? These are just little simple nursing procedures we do on an annual, on, on, a, on an hourly basis with all, all our patients in the ICU. But are we limiting these nursing care at some patients at some points? And, and, and what kind of authority do we have to do that? Or what kind of rationing do we have to proceed uh, to this uh, care, yes or no? So I think my take home message I follow up with Monica is that we do need policies for implicit rationing in the ICU to guide our professional uh, well, professional care, professional treatment, professional um, exercise of our professional conduct. Um, and, and shared responsibilities is needed to increase the quality of our ethical practices in the ICU. So, so far, thank you very much for, for this, this, this part of the webinar. I'm looking forward to the debate. Okay.
Thank you, Jos, for your presentation. Um, we have got a few questions. Um, and the first question is for Monica. Um, this is the question, Monica. Our team often struggles when trying to determine the exact prognosis of an individual patient. Do you think that a centrally managed database with relevant literature on prognosis would be a good idea? Now we all have to invent the wheel when looking for the best answer. And also, do you think that machine learning is the way to go? Monica. Well, these are three questions in one, I think. Well, first of all, I think um, assessing prognosis is really, really difficult. Um, we all struggle with it and we don't have any um, systems that will really provide us with the prognosis. So uh, what we do need to do is learn from outcomes. So there are many, many centers who see their patients afterwards or they send them questionnaires, but that outcome information is not used. So we should try to use to learn from our outcome. Second, if we want to design some kind of machine learning database, we need to know what, put, what to put in. And I think it's, we become more and more aware that the functioning of the patients before they get admitted to the ICU is very, very important. So um, assessing frailty, for example, is very important. Uh, knowing how the patient functions at home is very important. So first of all, we need to assess what we should put in the database. And then I think we should enrich it with long-term outcome. And then maybe machine learning will help us. And if I gonna, can add one more difficulty is, um, it's very difficult when you have a prognosis and you don't have a certain prognosis, but you have like 60 to 80% chance of a poor outcome. Uh, what kind of percentage of security do you need to make a decision? So some of us may be uh, reluctant to take a decision when they're not 99% sure that the patient will die, while others say, well, 90% is enough for me, and then I'll, I'll take the risk. risk. So that makes it very difficult as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question for Jos as well. Um, Jos, you have shown that rationing of ICU care can be in line with the principle of distributive justice, the ethical principle of distributive, distributive justice. <laughs> Do you think that it would be a good idea to involve family members or the patient himself in this principle? Is it a good idea to discuss with patients or the families that we may need the resources for other patients. Basic question is yes, <laughs> but I think um, what we've done, if you are working in a really family-centered care environment of an intensive care, you would have the, the family members already included from the beginning. And um, I would say a learning experience from the pediatric intensive care is that in the adult intensive care, we still have some, some learning experience to go forward to include family members in the care principles of the patients. Where we allow them to do more, we might even teach them to do a bit more. Uh, where they become the primary caregiver almost. I mean, that might be too far. But um, I think defining the care, that should always be uh, discussed at the early stages of uh, including the family members. If that is, If that was the question you put forward. I'm, I'm challenging the ICU staff uh, completely because... Um, if I would go back to my, my, my mother on the intensive care, I was doing a lot of basic care. And not because I was helping my colleagues who were intensive care students, but I just wanted to do that for my mom because I was a primary a carer at home for my mother. And I wanted to continue with this basic care. So it's, it's, it's these 
So when it comes to rationing of care, um, whatever reason you do so, um, whether we're busy, whether we have a pandemic, I think um, we should learn from, uh, from good examples where we need to include family members. Okay, here's another question for you, Jos. Um, I work in a small district hospital. When a patient with severe devastating brain injury following a fall is declined neurosurgical intervention because of futility and palliation is recommend recommended, how should the referral district hospital approach the issue of palliation? How should the district hospital refer? Um, so a patient is declined uh, a neurosurgical intervention because of futility. So how to proceed with palliation? Now, the, is it, I, I listen, I hear radiation, sorry for that, but it can't be that. Um, so what, 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 how to proceed with? Uh, uh, my, my, with palliation, yes. Well, the, the, the line is, is not very good sorry, to hear yeah. as well. Okay. Yeah, palliation, sorry. <laughs> sorry, the, 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 the audio is bad. Um, I, th I think, um, when you are in a district hospital and where, you, where the, the shared decision making, I would hope, is that uh, palliative care, well, you've, you've gone from curative care to palliative care with that patient in your district hospital, um, you, would, you would involve the, the patient and the family members, as Monica said, the surrogates could bring them in and try to sort of discuss as early as possible with the family members what their needs and wishes are. So there's obviously no transit transfer to another high specialized ICU. I mean, you would rather um, keep your patient in the district hospital and discuss with family members what to do. There's an ultimate, I mean, some family members, if not doesn't happen a lot, might say, I want my patient back home. Well, that's a challenge if you're having an ICU patient, that's another debate possibly, but I would go till the ultimate to make that even possible if it is expected that your patient is about to pass away in a fairly short time frame. So, so palli palliative care and palliation is where do it in your district hospital as early as possible and don't transit, no. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more question for Monica. Uh, here the question is, when there is no consensus in the team about foregoing uh, ICU treatment, uh, what to do? Well, that is a very interesting question and uh, we struggle with that and I'm sure many uh, colleagues do. Um, Usually, we need consensus to forego treatment, but we don't want to have full consensus when to continue treatment, and that is actually quite a large difference. Of course, you can only stop once, so um, that is a decision that you need uh, many colleagues involved. Uh, but you can you can decide with each other: Do you need consensus to forego treatment, or is a majority of at least say five uh, physicians enough and it's something that you should talk about when you make that protocol of difficult decisions and not decide for each patient separately but make sure it's in your protocol what kind of um, uh, do you want consensus for every decision or do you think majority from a large part of your group is enough Sorry, my sound is also awful, but I think we are done. Thank you for answering this question. <laughs> uh, um, there are no further questions um, via the website. Um, so 
I would like, there is one more remark from Jos, I see. Okay, Jos. Well, I'd like to, I'd like to follow up on the very first question. Um, yes. So we recently have done this international survey among uh, pediatricians. So these are the fellows, the fellow pediatrician and asking actually what kind of um, education and training did you have about difficult decision making and end of life care. And it seems that across Europe, um, and I think it's the same for us in intensive care as well, across Europe, the curriculum does not always have a really rigorous, um, um, well, uh, ethical uh, course or curriculum in it, uh, training. Um, I'm just, I'm just, I would think we might need a European standard on ethical training in intensive care staff. And I'm not sure, Monica, you know if that is, but I thought, to, to my knowledge, it's not. But there's something, a way forward where we would need to go. And that was your first question, actually. And I thought, oh, I might, it triggers me saying we need actually not a database, but rather a good uniform, standardized European, if possible, um, ethical training. Good, good addition, thank you. Okay, well, I would like to thank the two speakers again for being here and giving their presentations. And thank you all for, uh, for joining us. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye -bye. with experts from different parts of the world to share what we've learned from COVID, how we can rebuild the future, and how we can come out of this situation together.